Welcome everybody and, and thank you for joining us uh, this morning for our uh, webinar, the uh, Harnessing the Power of Digital. Uh, this is a joint event by Mills and Reeve and Crow um, and it's the first of two um, uh, a little mini series of two seminars. The first being today, where Andrew from Crow and myself will, uh, from Mills and Reeve will be talking. I'll be talking about digital charity, and, and Andrew will be covering uh, cyber crime and and fraud. Um, the event, the second one, is uh, uh, is in a couple of weeks' time on Wednesday, the eighteenth of November. So hopefully, you can join us for that as well. Um, on uh, the eighteenth. My colleague Simon Pedley will be talking about uh, members, uh, charity members' fiduciary duties um, in light of uh, the recent SIF case. Um, and Vicky from Crow uh, will be talking about uh, going concern issues. Um, so, thank you very much again for joining, and we'll we'll just jump straight in. I'm, I'm conscious that um, uh, we work with with many of you, and 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 many of you will know about Mills and Reef. For those but for those of you that do not. Um, we're a top 50 UK law firm. We've got a, over 500 lawyers spread across six offices in England. Uh, I'm a solicitor in our charities team, um, working for our Manchester and Leeds office, but working nationally. And we work with over 200 charities, uh, including some you may have heard of, um, uh, as well as a variety of uh, institutes, universities, um, colleges and schools. Um, so why is a lawyer talking to you today about uh, digital. Um, well, it's my intention to talk briefly about how digital can uh, impact on a charity's uh, legal governance. So, so let's jump straight in. I've, I've got a slide there, hopefully, that you can see on the screen. Um, and the pandemic has, has obviously required many charities to embrace uh, new digital processes and technologies. And a really good example has been this emergence of virtual meetings. Obviously the restrictions on face-to-face -face meetings during the um, initial lockdown uh, led businesses, charities, public sectors, even family and friends groups to discover uh, the delights of online meeting platforms like Microsoft Teams and Zoom. Um, although I would say I'm fairly tech savvy, I'll be honest, I've not even heard of Microsoft Teams or Zoom uh, before the lockdown. Uh, in March. So in over 10 years as a charity lawyer and most recently as well as a trust, charity trustee, I've just never even used them in practice. Um, and just to prove uh, how new it all was to me, um, uh, on my first Microsoft Teams call as a board of trustees um, uh, in early April, um, on my screen was sort of three or four of the 12 or so people um, who I knew were on the call. Um, and after a while, it seemed, I sort of, I thought I'd worked it out. It seemed to me that the only people who um, had spoken recently, only those who had spoken recently were, were showing on my screen. Um, uh, as I was muted and not spoken for some time, I'd perhaps rather naively assumed I had fallen off everybody's screen. So I uh, picked up my guitar and practiced a few chords <laughs> and everything was, was fine and great. And uh, 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 I thought everything was fine until obviously the chair asked if I would be singing a song for everybody. So, <laughs> so quite embarrassing for me. Um, but I think hopefully we've all finally become accustomed to virtual meetings. Um, but, but I thought it would be worth uh, uh, discussing what the law says about virtual meetings briefly. And so generally a charity's constitution uh, sets out how meetings um, are to be held. And, and from my experience, many constitutions do not contain provisions for virtual meetings. But why is this an issue, Mark, you say? We've been doing it for months and months and no one has complained. Um, well, um, if there is no appropriate provision in place, just carrying on with virtual meetings could, could actually be an issue, I think, for a couple of reasons. The first one is technically it's potentially a breach of the charity's governing document if there is no provision in place. So the Charity Commission may consider it a sign of mismanagement. I think in isolation, this is unlikely to be a major concern, but if it is part of wider investigations, wider issues, um, it could potentially be a regulatory risk. Um, secondly, um, without provisions in place, the validity of a decision made at those meetings could be brought into question, uh, perhaps by a creditor, by a third party or a disgruntled trustee or employee. 
And this, of course, could lead to disputes or, or in the worst case scenario for decisions to be set aside by the courts. So the government foresaw some of these issues um, and it enacted the Corporate Insolvency and Governance, Governance Act 2020, CIGA for short, um, uh, earlier in the year, uh, which allows charitable companies and CIOs to um, hold members meetings electronically by phone or video even where the governing document states such meetings must be face to face. And these provisions have been extended to the 30th de of December in light of the ongoing nature of the pandemic. It, it might be that they, they're extended further, we'll have to watch this space. But CIGA, the CIGA Act does not apply to all charities, it doesn't apply to charitable trusts or associations, um, or charities governed by Royal Charter or Acts of Parliament. It also does not apply to trustee meetings. Uh, so what we can, so what can, you know, what can we do in those scenarios, uh, particularly uh, trustee meetings? So the current guidance from the Charity Commission states, um, in the current situation, it may be difficult to hold face-to-face -face meetings. Yes, um, generally, if there is no such clause in the governing document and you decide to hold meetings over the phone or using digital solutions, we will understand, but we should, but you should record this decision and you've done this to demonstrate good governance of your charity. So I think this promise from the Charity Commission to take a pragmatic and proportionate approach uh, where meetings need to be postponed or held virtually in order to comply with social distancing, even where it may be con contrary to the rules of the charity's constitution, is helpful for the time being. Um, but I don't think it provides a great deal of legal certainty and I think it's only a short term solution. As someone who's had to leave the office early to sit in rush hour traffic to, to make trustee meetings, um, I for one will want to hold on, I think, to virtual meetings to some extent. I'm looking forward to getting back face to face, but I think to some extent virtual meetings will, um, will feature heavily, I think, in the future. So I think providing a le that legal certainty, providing that future flexibility um, in the medium to long term, I think is really important. And I would strongly advise charities to review uh, their constitution uh, to ensure they've got those appropriate provisions in place. I think now is probably a good time to look to do that as well. It's AGM season, um, uh, you know, but also obviously minds are very much focused at the moment. So it might be a good time to, to look at this. I think even if you do not think your charity will keep virtual meetings, and I know there are many charities out there that, that will go back to face-to-face -to -face entirely, uh, as and when they can, um, I think it might still be worth considering having that provision in there as a bit of an insurance policy if, if you know, God forbid we face something like this again in the future. The other thing I want to mention, um, uh, just in passing really, is, 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 is that I think actually this... Um, this this the new virtual meetings and this new remote working i think it's a real opportunity for diversity to improve diversity and inclusion um for for some charities once that geographical re requirement sort of moved out the way um and timings of meetings perhaps can be more flexible i do think uh, that might improve um, diversity on, on on many boards out there um, the final thing i want to mention on this slide is, is electronic resolution um, I'm talking about trustee resolutions here. So this is where a trustee meeting cannot be held or is not due to be held, um, but the trustees want to pass a, a quick resolution, say by email. Um, old governing documents simply will not provide for it. Um, and therefore, if you are looking to potentially update your, your constitution to allow virtual meetings. Perhaps now is also a good time to look at this, uh, the wider electronic decision-making uh, powers. If your constitution does have a power, check the limitation of it. Historically, um, these were limited to unanimous decisions, uh, obviously due to the lack of discussion or debate that would be had in the absence of a trustee meeting. So in other words, if a, if a decision was contentious or there was any dissent, it could not be passed as a written resolution and would need to go to the next trustee meeting. Um, obviously this causes, causes an issue if you know, somebody's on holiday, if anybody remembers what 
holidays were. Um, uh, you know, or if, if, or if a trustee generally cannot be reached. And I think all of those arguments about bypassing a proper debate, they're still there. Um, so I would say that, you are, that if you are looking to insert quite flexible meeting provisions, for example, the ability to, to have urgent Zoom meetings, then perhaps unanimous consent is still appropriate. Um, but where there wouldn't be the option for an urgent virtual meeting, I, I definitely can see the value in trying to make it easier uh, to make quick decisions, uh, in which case maybe uh, reducing it from unanimous to, I don't know, a majority may be appropriate. Um, I know from my own practice, from my own experience, that, that when we as a board are looking to make electronic decisions, actually there's quite a, uh, uh, an exchange of views in those emails before the vote itself is cast. So, so, so I think there is a, a natural safeguard there anyway. Um, so moving on uh, to the next slide. Um, uh, I think moving on from this idea of digital ability to, to aid in decision making, actually from my experience the pandemic has led charities to consider their wider digital strategy. Um, not every charity has a digital strategy and I thought it would be interesting if we could run this little poll um, uh, to see uh, which of you actually has a a digital strategy. So does your charity have a digital strategy? Yes, no, unsure. If you um, uh, don't mind voting for us. That would be really helpful just to give me a bit of a feel for you know, I think we're getting the picture of the majority being no or some are unsure so but certainly the, the, the majority being no or adding no and unsure together certainly outweighs yes which I think is really interesting. There has been a recent survey generally across sector about digital strategy and I think the, the picture that was coming out was roughly about half and half have a strategy which is is not too far I think from 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 what we're seeing there as well. Um, what would be interesting to know as well would be it would be where a charity does have a strategy how quickly things are currently moving uh, you know perhaps what impact the pandemic itself has had I, I've certainly mm. seen some examples where digital strategy has slowed down has stopped entirely because of capacity issues because staff have simply you know put it to one side we'll think about that when we've got a bit more time in some cases though i've also seen uh, where obviously predominantly driven by distant working needs but this has really accelerated uh, uh, charities digital strategy as a whole um, Okay, I think if we can please just move on to the next slide, um, which is, just apologies, I'm getting some, which is a, a, a bit of a cartoon um, that, that I found um, on, the, on, the, on the internet, which I found quite funny. Um, uh, and, and it was this idea of, of digital transformation and, and, and whether COVID has, has accelerated things. And I think it's, uh, it, it seems to be not just in the charity sector, of course, but, but, but generally the, the people are, are, uh, are, are, are you know, COVID is, is accelerating things. Um, uh, and if we can move on to the next slide as, as well, Kate, which was just another, this was actually a form, apologies, I've, I've stolen this from, from a Forbes meme that I also found on the, on the internet as well, which was, uh, which, which was suggesting that, uh, again, that COVID-19 is, is really pushing digital um, uh, transformation. Um, if, if we can move on, Kate, as well to the next slide. Uh, Although it's usually in practice the executive who, who really drive digital change, um, as of course it helps their day job. Um, well, but, but like everything in a charity, it is, it is the trustees' ultimate responsibility to oversee this. And actually, in practice, what I'm seeing as well is, is, at the moment is that actually many executive teams are, are just too busy fighting fires. So actually, trustees are having to do some of the heavy lifting here, or using this opportunity to really sit back and look at at their strategy um, uh, at trustee level. Um, 
where do you start with this? Well, there is help at hand uh, for trustees and execs who are looking to, to develop their digital strategy. And this is through the charity Digital Code. Um, the code is intended to, to be used as a benchmark uh, for a charity's progress uh, in relation to its digital technology, but, but also to help uh, inform key decisions. In a couple of weeks time, the code itself will actually be two years old. So hopefully some of you will have come across it before. And, and I think hopefully Kate, we can run this next poll, which, which was just to get a feeling um, uh, of, of, of how many of you have actually come across this charity digital code. Giving you a few, a few options there, never heard of it. Yes, you've heard of it, but you've not really engaged with it. And, and then the final two just being, well, we've looked at it and it's, it's helped us with our initial strategy and then the final one being what actually we look at this regularly and, and use this as a as a regular benchmark. What we're clearly seeing there is that, that the vast majority, well the majority has not heard of it but those that have heard of it actually the vast majority of those uh, have, uh, uh, have not even looked at it. Um, if you don't mind I'll run through it quite quickly because I think it's useful and, and I'll explain why as I go along. Um, I just clear this down so I can see my screen again. Okay. So the code was produced to provide charities with practical advice uh, on how to incorporate digital uh, technology into their work. And it was created using funding by uh, the Lloyds Banking Group and the Corp Foundation. But it was actually developed by a steering group of, um, of almost 20 organizations, which actually, if you look at the list, re reads like a who's who of the charity infrastructure world. So it includes the Charity Commission, the, the Charity Finance Group, uh, Akivo, NAVCA, the NCVO, Office for Civil Societies, the Small Charities Coalition. So some really serious organizations that uh, are there to, to help charities and, and really know what they're doing. Uh, so it is an important document and something I would recommend people look at. The code's not a regulatory requirement, but it offers what the steering groups, so all those organisations, including the Commission, by the way, considers to be best practice. So it's aiming to be a practical tool. It's aiming to help you identify what you are doing well, any gaps that you want to address. So I think it is a really useful tool for developing strategy and ongoing monitoring. I have no evidence of this, but I do wonder if use of the code and, and reference to it in your annual reports might actually help charities with fundraising. Um, I know that many big foundations obviously review a charity's annual report when deciding whether to fund, and I know that many of them will look for references to the charity governance code. That's really important to them. References to codes is a good sign it's a sign of a well-run charity, it demonstrates good governance, um, and it demonstrates an understanding of current sector best practice. So I know, more than anecdotally, I know that the found, that foundations will fund charities or, or will favour charities with reference to Charity Governance Code. I just wonder whether reference to the Charity Digital Code would also help um, there as well. So, so certainly for, for you that, that have that digital strategy already, I think it's an easy win to be able to look at the code and, and to perhaps make reference to how you are using it. Um, one thing the digital code makes clear is that it, that it expects this to be to, to the leaders, a charity's leaders to really be in the driving seat for this. Um, that they need to set out a vision um, for where digital could take the charity and obviously to develop a strategic approach uh, to get there. Um, the pandemic, like I say, in my experience has, has led some charities to really focus on their digital charity, uh, their digital strategy. Whether that's the intention is to use that to reach more people in a socially distant time, or whether it's to save costs by freeing up time and resources internally, and, and, and we've seen both as well. Uh, the structure of the code itself it will seem familiar to anybody who does it was already aware of the Charity Governance Code, as I mentioned earlier. It sets out seven principles, seven key principles. I'll run through them really quickly. The first one, leadership. So like I said, the, the code expects this to be run from the very top. So the trustees and the exec to run this. And understanding that, that, that digital covers the entire charity. So obviously an organizational wide strategy is required. 
The second principle it covers is user led. So it, it, it suggests that charities should identify how uh, charities users, be their beneficiaries, members, staff, or stakeholders, how they use digital, and then to build the organization strategy around that. The third principle is culture. So as an organization, do you have a culture which breeds digital use, that breeds innovation, that allows people to feel that they can uh, uh, suggest transformation, that they can collaborate? And obviously this ties back in with the leadership um, principle at the beginning. The fourth principle is strategy. So obviously to have a strategy itself and, and, and the code itself says the key word the code uses here is ambitious. So it really encourages charities to be ambitious with their vision. Um, the fifth one is skills. Uh, the code says in order for all of this to be successful, you need to have necessary skills at all levels of the organization. Um, the, uh, the sixth principle is, is managing risks and ethics. So obviously recognizing that with new technology, new processes comes risk, for instance, cybersecurity, data processing, etc. cetera. Uh, so really important that the trustees consider the risks, build this into their usual risk processes and, and registers. And the final principle, the seventh principle is about adaptability. So it says, how will the charity encourage feedback? How will you review your strategy regularly? Have that feedback. How will you regularly uh, monitor your progress? How will you manage changes in technology? So those are the seven key principles. I think that the takeaway from this section is, 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 is if you do not have a digital strategy, go and read the code. I think it would be really helpful uh, to get you thinking about your opportunities there. If you do have a digital strategy, I think the takeaway is go read the code as well. So I think it's always helpful uh, to regularly benchmark your strategies uh, and, and to obviously measure your impact and, and identify your gaps. And the final slide um, from me is, uh, is, is, and I'm conscious of time, so I'll, I'll, I'll just quickly run through this, but, but my IT and data protection colleague asked me to mention this as a general point that obviously with increased use of digital um, also comes uh, increased need for compliance with the relevant legislation and of course increased cyber security risk, um, you know, which Andrew will touch upon shortly. So charities need to put in place obviously proportionate measures to protect, protect their funds and their data, their supporters and uh, reputation. One example of this continued need for compliance with legislation is GDPR. Um, uh, most charities obviously were aiming to achieve compliance by the, the original GDPR deadline, 25th of May, 2018. I cannot believe, when I was looking at this, I couldn't believe it was two and a half, uh, uh, two years ago, over two years ago. Uh, um, uh, but the compliance process for GDPR was always intended uh, to be ongoing. And I do wonder how many charities have actually considered this, uh, have reviewed perhaps an updated policies, privacy statements, for example, in the light of, of the, the digital developments we're seeing in the sector during the pandemic. So, um, you know, have we considered the data processes, our security arrangements uh, in light of staff working from home, for instance? Um, GDPR compliance, regu you know, just general compliance is, is an ongoing compliance, obviously still really important. And sure we've got uh, our su supported data is kept up to date and sure we've got appropriate security safeguards, uh, especially as I say, considering home working. Um, I think it's also important we continue with our policies and training. Um, obviously it's a really important part of any investigation if the ICO uh, does come looking. Um, so, so let's not forget um, policies and training, e even though we're busy with the day job. And obviously, really important still for, for our backup arrangements, again, to uh, protect against cyber risks. And the final thing for me, just quickly, this, this idea of cloud computing, um, which, which I know has become commonplace during, uh, for many charities during the pandemic with the shift to, to remote working. It can be invaluable. Uh, it really can, but it's also not without risks that need to be managed. Um, cloud computing, that computing is, um, so I'm told, effectively rentable computing power. Forgive me, I'm, I'm not an IT expert, but um, 
um, you know, I, I do I do appreciate that, that, that it is uh, obviously um, uh, mobile by its very nature and that services are being hosted uh, remotely through the internet, uh, including, uh, for example, the Zoom that we are using right now. Um, it obviously prevents, uh, pre pre presents a great opportunity. Um, it gives charities the ability to have good, uh, up-to-date, adaptable IT without spending uh, the money typically associated with the technology. Um, I know many organisations find it really helpful for things like business continuity, disaster recovery, those sorts of things, um, uh, and scalability. Um, security of it is also really important and it can provide higher levels of, of security. Organisations like Microsoft and Google who often provide these services will have better security than most charities. Um, I think the takeaway is that the that, that charities uh, should be checking how their data and operations can be uh, migrated from one provider to another or, or back in-house and where their data is being stored, checking where that is, if it is overseas, um, uh, from a GDPR, perspective, uh, GDPR perspective, do we need to be updating our documentation and privacy statements um, to cover uh, that overseas transfer? Uh, so I'll leave it there. Um, and I'll, uh, uh, it will, we'll, I think we're going to have a bit of a Q&A session at the end. Um, and I'll pass over to Andrew. So uh, thank you very much. And Andrew. I think I just wanted oh, to say a brief, it's all right, um, a brief introduction before um, I hand over to Andrew. Um, so just to say, my name is Vicky Zulis, as the slide suggests, and my little name tag does also. Um, I'm the partner in Manchester with responsibility for not-for-profit at Crow. Um, we're very pleased to be running these joint seminars with Mills and Reeve. Um, you will be seeing a lot more of me in December when I'll be speaking about going concern and what organisations need to do to demonstrate that that still remains relevant. Um, but today's presentation is from Andrew Whitaker, who's a member of our forensic team and is going to talk about cybercrime. So I will hand you over to uh, Andrew. Thank you, Vicky. Um, uh, good morning, everyone. And thank you to Mark and also to Mills and Reeve for asking me to join today's webinar. Um, as Vicky said, I work in Crow's forensic services team, um, normally based in London, but uh, have responsibility for um, throughout the UK um, and internationally as well. Um, I, I think today's webinar is, is very well timed. Um, we're approaching um, another period of, of lockdown for England. Um, some of the other uh, jurisdictions are in different stages of, of lockdown. Um, so where the pressure was to return to the office and to some normal working, we're back um, working from home again um, with all of the, the issues that that um, poses as far as uh, cyber security is concerned. Um, it's also good timing in the fact that the National Cyber Security Centre published their annual report today. Um, and that, uh, I confess, hands up, I haven't read all of it, but um, some of the, the, the headline um, points are, are of great interest. Um, uh, the last 12 months have seen a significant increase in um, cyber attacks on the UK and, and the UK's infrastructure. Um, and the National Cyber Security Centre dealt with um, a significant number of attacks on um, healthcare and research, um, trying to gather um, what we're doing um, to fight COVID, um, but also to disrupt some of those services that um, are supporting people who become unwell through COVID. Um, many of these are, are state sponsored or, or state condoned, so really high level. Um, but the National Cyber Security Center has been doing an awful lot of work um, to try and prevent these attacks. Um, for example, they've been monitoring over 1 million NHS IP addresses. Um, so a lot happening in the background to protect us. Um, what I want to talk about today really is um, not this high level stuff, the state sponsored stuff, um, but where charities um, are, are attacked, where their, their members of staff are targeted. Um, and it's the, the, the lower level um, cyber attacks and, and, and cyber fraud that uh, is, is coming towards charities. Um, so I'd like to start off just by clarifying what we mean by, by fraud uh, and cybercrime. Um, we'll have a look at some of the drivers for 
um, fraud, put it into some, some context. Um, I'll have a look at how uh, some frauds work um, and I'll finish off with a couple of uh, case studies. And, and of course, the key thing for, for charities, uh, well, there are a number of key things of, of why we need to do some work to uh, prevent cyber attacks, to prevent cyber fraud, is, is obviously the loss of money. Um, most charities have seen donations drop off. Uh, many of their, their fundraising activities have, have had to stop, um, which means income um, isn't as good as it should be. Um, and if we lose more money to fraud, then um, that's just making a, a, a dire situation worse. Um, but of course, it, it's not only um, financial losses that are of concern, um, it's interruption to our operations. Um, if, if our systems are infected by ransomware, it means we can't do the work that uh, we should be doing. Uh, and then coupled with that, we've got uh, reputational damage. Um, if donors become aware that uh, our systems aren't secure uh, and their personal details are being leaked online, then um, people don't want to donate. Uh, and perhaps at the bottom of the list, but still a significant reason, um, it takes an awful lot of management time to try and sort these things out when they do occur. Um, so, what are the differences um, between fraud and cybercrime? Well, the, the, the legislation is there on the, on the slide. Um, the Fraud Act of 2016 quite nicely deals with um, most fraudulent circumstances um, because cybercrime is a crime um, and fraud is a crime. Um, making a false representation, sending somebody an email purporting to be from your bank is a false representation. Um, if we do lose money, then we can use the civil law to, uh, to try and recover our, um, our losses. Uh, very old case there, Derry versus Peak, 1889, but still is the benchmark for civil fraud. Um, if someone's made a false representation, they've said something that isn't true, uh, they knew it was false at the time, uh, and that has led to some loss, then civil fraud has occurred, um, a much lower hurdle to get over as far as the, the standard of proof is concerned. Um, so I think it's fair to say we have a mixed response from law enforcement where there is criminal fraud. Um, so we should also consider uh, the, the civil options that are open to us um, where fraud has occurred to try and re uh, recover the losses that, uh, that, that we've suffered. Uh, next slide, please, uh, Kate. Um, but let's look at cybercrime, because that's the, uh, the, the main thrust of this morning's webinar. Um, it's still dealt with by uh, existing legislation. Uh, and we can put cybercrime into two camps. Um, one is cyber dependent, so that the crime couldn't occur if it wasn't for a computer being involved. Uh, and that includes things like um, the, the distribution of viruses, um, ransomware, um, and, and the other forms of, uh, of cybercrime, as you see there. They're all covered by the Computer Misuse Act of 1990. Um, legislation that's been around for 30 years, um, very forward-looking when it came onto the statute books, uh, but still valid today, still effective, uh, and can deal with these crimes when they occur uh, and when the offenders are traced and found. Uh, and then we get cyber-enabled crime, um, so these are traditional crimes, such as fraud and, and theft, um, but a computer is being used to commit them, um, where people sort of steal data, steal money, um, fraud offences um, uh, are being committed. Um, what we mustn't forget also is that computers are used to commit all sorts of other crime, uh, such as hate crime, uh, and, and the other offences that, that we occur there. Um, so when we're developing um, our cybercrime policies, that the focus will be on um, prevention of loss, it'll be on uh, prevention of interruption to our operations, but let's not forget how computers can be used for these other um, activities. Uh, and let's make sure that uh, our, our policies and procedures include measures to try and prevent or uh, reduce the likelihood of these. Uh, next slide, please, Kate. 
Um, so what is attractive about charities to cyber criminals and, and fraudsters in general? Um, data produced by the Charities Commission um, says that £100 billion in revenue is generated by the not-for-profit sector um, for England and Wales. Clearly, that won't be as great this year, um, but still a significant chunk of money. Um, it, that in itself is attractive to, to criminals. Um, and, and then you feed into the mix that the, the number of charities that there are in the UK, a huge range uh, from the very smallest one-man band to huge um, in international operating charities uh, that are globally recognised, all, all operating uh, in the UK. Um, those charities employ 880,000 people, give or take a few. Um, they just represent a, a, a cross-section of the UK population. Um, they are equally as vulnerable to fraud, equally uh, vulnerable to being manipulated, to being um, socially engineered, to disclose data, um, to do things that perhaps they shouldn't be because they think they're doing the right thing to get something done. But actually what they're doing is exposing um, their charity to the risk of cybercrime. Um, and in all of this, they are the weakest link in the chain. Um, it's hard work for cyber criminals to try and break into an organization's network. Um, as you can see sort of further down the slide, the, the UK cybersecurity market is worth uh, over five billion pounds. Um, so a huge amount of money is being spent on trying to protect um, networks, protect uh, systems. Um, lots of lots of research going into um, the, the latest methods to try and secure everything. So as far as a, um, a cyber criminal is concerned, um, they will go for the weakest link, which is the, the, the human that is, uh, is in the chain. Um, and money is lost to cybercrime. Uh, 2.3 billion lost to, to fraud, um, according to the Charity Commission. And data, some research undertaken by the University of Portsmouth um, has, has shown quite clearly that during every recession, the incidence of fraud increases significantly. Um, it was interesting looking at the last recession. Um, normally after a recession, um, the, the levels of fraud start to reduce. But after the, the, the financial crash in, in 2007, 2008, um, the levels of fraud didn't drop after that. They, they still carried on in a, an upwards trajectory. Um, Commentators say that we are in or going into the, the largest recession the UK has ever had. Um, and then when we sort of factor into that, the, um, the, the, the impact of the pandemic on the way that we work, uh, all of our remote operations, um, then it's quite clear, and, and certainly the National Cyber Security Centre's report today demonstrates that the fraud cybercrime is, is rapidly increasing uh, at this time. Um, as an illustration of that, there are 5,000 new scam websites being set up every day, uh, an equivalent number being taken down. Um, but cyber criminals wouldn't be setting these things up if they didn't get some return from them. And I think perhaps most worryingly of all is the last bullet point on the slide. 18% um, of UK organisations just don't know if they've been subject to a cyber attack or not. Um, they couldn't tell you how many cyber attacks they've suffered. Um, so how many of those have got through? How much data has been lost? How much money uh, has disappeared? Um, quite frightening, really. Uh, next slide, please, Kate. So how do uh, cyber criminals, how do cyber fraudsters work? Um, well, they want to select a target. Uh, and one of the easiest ways of doing that is, is to look at data breaches. This is where other hackers have, have got into a, an organization's network. Um, they've downloaded their perhaps user databases or customer databases, um, offered it for sale on the dark web, um, and then eventually it all gets just published on the dark web and it's, it's all there for all to see. Uh, we're all using Zoom this morning. Um, in April of this year, Zoom suffered a, a cyber, a, a data breach. 
Um, and that's a screenshot there from, uh, from that breach. Um, and as you can see from that, it um, exposes people's logon details, their um, email address, and the password that they use to access Zoom. Now, a significant number of, of those people will have used their password that they use for their Gmail address or, or whatever email address they use to, to log into Zoom. Um, it's very difficult for us as human beings to keep a track of all our passwords for all of the different websites that, uh, and accounts that we access. Um, so people, uh, fraudsters will pick these up. Uh, they will try to get into these people's um, email accounts uh, via the web. Uh, and, and some will prove uh, that they can. Uh, um, they will access the email address, they'll see what email traffic there is. And if charities are allowing people to use um, perhaps private Gmail e uh, email addresses to conduct charity business, um, then financial details can be picked up. Um, or if providers uh, are using Gmail addresses or other uh, free webmail addresses, um, then those emails can be picked up and perhaps if invoices are being submitted then bank account details can be changed and uh, it's uh, it's very easy for the fraudster to do. Uh, there's a spate at the moment of, of people using gmail addresses to, uh, to send out google drive notifications to say there's been um, an addition to your uh, google drive uh, or we're sharing uh, our google drive with you uh, and of course that just leads people to uh, malicious software. Um, I'd also question how many of us are on LinkedIn, probably the majority of us, um, but how many of us have changed our LinkedIn password since we first registered? Um, LinkedIn was subject of a data breach back in 2016, 167 million accounts compromised, um, which not only means that people can get into our uh, LinkedIn accounts and um, change things if they wanted to do so, um, but it means that they've got the username, the password that they can then try and access uh, other sites that we've used the same credentials for. Um, so data breaches are, are really, I suppose, the biggest source of, uh, of helpful information for, for the cyber criminal. But there's a lot more um, information out there. Uh, next slide, please, Kate. Um, we're early November, um, Remembrance Day isn't far away. Um, so if I was a fraudster, I'd be thinking about, well, well, who could I target? Um, uh, and this is a charity that I've done some work for previously, uh, Blesma, which is the British Limbless Ex-Servicemen's Association. Um, and I think as, as a fraudster, as a cyber criminal, well, perhaps I can do something with this uh, because people can't uh, donate money to Blesma through normal means. So um, donors will be looking for some online methods of, of giving money to, to Blesma. Um, so the first thing I would do uh, as a, a fraudster would do a reconnaissance of Blesma's website. And you'll see the exploit database uh, that, uh, that is there. Um, this is freely available uh, on the surface web. Um, it's de designed to assist IT professionals in securing their networks. Um, so that they can see where all the weaknesses are, um, uh, where all the latest patches uh, have, have been um, uploaded by software vendors, um, and they can secure their networks. But of course, um, things like this are used by cyber criminals. Um, and you'll see their Google hacking database, um, where we can use Google to find weaknesses in, in networks. Um, just recently, um, uh, one of these Google hacks was used to identify over 500 uh, online or, or irrigation systems, commercial irrigation systems that could be accessed quite easily online by, by anyone. Um, so anyone could disrupt the, um, the irrigation of crops um, that, that were being, being grown. Um, it also identifies critical security flaws. Um, and what I would uh, recommend is that um, firms whether you or, or charities whether you're using um, in-house IT uh, or, or con contracting out is to get some um, benchmarking of, of how secure your systems are. Um, 
we, we did some benchmarking uh, of a professional services sector, looking at the top 200 firms uh, in that particular sector. Um, I found some, some quite um, startling results. 80% um, uh, of those firms were using at least one server with um, a well-known vulnerability still sitting there that hadn't been patched, um, that still left a, a, a back door open to, to people to get in. 79% um, of those firms had at least one web domain address registered to a private email address. Um, so then, they, that then gives that private individual the ability to do all sorts of things with that um, web address. Um, that they could they could lock it all down uh, that that web domain um, if they wanted. Um, if they'd fallen out with the the, the, the charity that was employing them. Um, so really that shouldn't be uh, uh, something that could be co controlled by somebody through their own personal email address. Uh, next slide, please. So um, I think, well, okay, I've had a look at uh, Blesma's uh, website. That seems fairly secure. It's, uh, it's all been updated. All the patches are there. Um, so I'll look to try and find a, another website that looks very much like it. Um, and there we are, you see, I could go online and buy the Blesmaz uh, co.uk website just for a penny. Um, and of course with that, then then gives me um, the, the, the facility to create email addresses with, uh, with the blesmas.co.uk um, address. Um, and many people don't look at the detail uh, of an email address when, when an email comes in. Uh, and lo and behold, um, I, I can spoof people into saying, yes, I'm from Blesma. Uh, next slide, please. Um, what I might also want to do is create my own um, copy of Blesma's um, website. Um, it's easily done, just right clicking onto a, a web page will give me the opportunity to see all of the code, which I can then copy and paste. Um, create my own uh, website, which is blesmas.co.uk. It looks exactly like the blesma.org website. But of course, when uh, uh, we come to the e-commerce um, section of the website where people will be making donations or, or, or buying um, things online, um, then I'll insert my own uh, financial information there. And of course, everyone uh, who believes that they're making a, a donation to Blesma is making a donation to me. I'll keep that up and running for a couple of weeks uh, until we go past Remembrance Day, uh, and then I'll disappear. Uh, next slide, please. So that's one aspect, one way in which uh, uh, cyber criminals will target an organization uh, and attack it. Um, but there are many others. Um, some of these terms you've, you've possibly come across, spear phishing, um, which is slightly different from normal phishing where mass emails are sent out pr pretending to come from a, a bank, for example. Spear phishing is when a, a particular individual is targeted. Um, and as a cyber criminal, uh, I'll be looking at perhaps trying to take over that individual's um, email account if I'm able to, uh, using data breaches and things like this. Um, or I will use social engineering. Uh, I will try um, and use old fashioned confidence tricks on people who work with my target um, to try and convince them that, that I am um, their colleague. I am the person that they work with um, and get them to do things that they shouldn't be doing, whether that's paying invoices without supporting paperwork um, or disclosing other sort of confidential or fi financial information. Uh, so if we could go to the, the next slide, please, Kate, thank you. Um, and one of the most useful tools for me as the cyber criminal is something like Facebook or other uh, social networks. Um, it's a little bit more difficult these days. It used to be very easy to um, uh, identify people on Facebook, Facebook um, until the Cambridge Analytica uh, scandal. Um, a little while ago, which led to Facebook tightening things up. Uh, but there are still some techniques that could be used to, to fairly easily identify people who, as we see there, work at Blesma. 
um, they've told us who they are. Um, so I can dive into each of these profiles and start building um, up a picture of, of who these people are, what their likes and dislikes are, who their, their family members are, uh, who their friends are, and um, get a really good working knowledge of, of these individuals. Um, I'll then augment that with information that I picked up from other social media, such as, as Twitter, um, LinkedIn, um, to give me a good picture of, of that individual. Um, then I'll use all of that information, perhaps with a spoofed email address, to target somebody else working at, at Blesma, um, to make them think through what I'm saying that I am the genuine member of staff. Um, the name there, Ab Abby Paz Wilkins, fundraising relationship executive. So she's going to be talking about money. Um, so it would be good for me to um, either target Abby Wilkins or to pretend to be Abby Wilkins. Uh, next slide, please. Um, of course, the, the, the greatest push um, these days is on two-factor authentication, uh, and, and quite rightly so. Uh, it's very important that that is used, but what we must be uh, conscious of is that mobile phones can be spoofed. Um, uh, and you'll see th some information there that um, a number of Android phones um, contain some, some weaknesses that will allow um, cyber criminals quite easily to, um, to change those things that are, are bullet pointed there. You know, the, the proxy address for internet traffic, um, the email server, uh, directory servers for synchronizing contacts and calendar, for example. Um, Samsung don't think that that, that is a problem. Uh, uh, and haven't updated their firmware um, on, on mobile phones that are out there, uh, which is, is very sad. But um, mobile phone spoofing, as we see from the next slide, um, does happen. If we can have the next slide, please, Kate. Thank you. Um, and we have an example there. Uh, a charity lost £335,000 to uh, a cyber criminal network um, four o'clock on a Friday afternoon um, uh, somebody in the charities finance department gets a phone call from uh, who they believe was the Royal Bank of Scotland um, saying yeah we think that uh, your charity's bank account has been compromised by um, by fraudsters uh, and we need you to um, to run some checks to do some, some things for us just to make sure that uh, everything is okay now. Um, uh, the, the call went on for uh, tens of minutes and um, before the, 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 the member of staff agreed to um, make what, what they thought was some test payments, um, they said, well, how, how do I know that you're calling from the, the Royal Bank of Scotland? And um, the, the fraudster says, well, um, go online and, um, you know, you'll see the, the Royal Bank of Scotland um, telephone number, uh, which they did. And they said, have, have you got a mobile phone? Um, yes, yes, of course. Um, well, I'll call you on that, that mobile phone and you'll see on the, the, the caller display, it'll be the same number that's displayed on your computer screen for the Royal Bank of Scotland. Um, so they did that. And of course, the same number popped up. So the, um, the, the finance person thought, well, yeah, this is the, the Bank of Scotland, Royal Bank of Scotland that's calling me. Of course, it wasn't. Uh, there are numerous services out there, um, the majority in the US, uh, where it's possible to spoof any number that you want. Um, so for the payment of a very small fee, um, and we're talking less than a pound, um, your call will be routed through uh, this server in the States and it will display to the recipient whatever number you want it to display. So they displayed the bank's number. Um, the bank will never ever ask you to make any test payments. And of course, all of these 13 payments went to the fraudster's bank account. Uh, next slide, please, Kate. Uh, a list of things there that the Charity Commission um, says uh, should be reported by charities. Um, unless people do report things um, we don't know the true scale of, of, of what is happening um, how much the charity sector has been uh, affected by uh, fraud and cybercrime 
uh, uh, next slide please, on conscious of, of time. Um, there are lots of things that we can do, very low cost things, um, giving awareness training to staff, uh, monitoring web domains. So, so go online um, to one of these websites that sell email, uh, uh, internet addresses and have a look at the ones that are similar to yours. Um, we don't have to buy them. Um, as long as they stay available, then things are okay. But if you detect that one has been bought, then perhaps you need to be on your guard and, and start researching it um, in, in a little bit more depth. Uh, make sure staff um, have a, a social media policy about what they can and can't put on social media in relation to their, their charity and their employment. Um, have a look at things like, have I been pawned? Um, has your email address uh, appeared in a data breach? Um, so have a look at that. Uh, report suspicious emails to phishing.gov.uk. Uh, that's run by the National Cyber Security Centre. So again, it gives them an idea of, of what's happening and it enables them to take down spoof websites. Um, and make use of the National Cyber Security Centre's small charity guide. Lots of really good and free advice there. Uh, finally from me, uh, the, the last slide please, Kate. Um, and this is the last or the only advert you'll, you'll see from me. Um, please visit uh, this. It's a, um, a tool that we've devised with the University of Portsmouth uh, to enable organisations to assess, uh, to have a snapshot of their vulnerability to cybercrime. Uh, it's completely free of charge um, and it will give you uh, certainly some food for thought, if, if nothing else. Um, so that's it from me. Thank you for, for listening. Um, I'd be happy to take any questions uh, that you may have using the, the question and answer button at the, the bottom of the screen. Thanks, Andrew. That was really good. I, I think before, just to give, I mean, we've got a few minutes and just, just to give uh, anybody an option, opportunity to ask a question. I, I've got a quick one around the website. And I, that was eye-opening for me to, you know, to, to see how easy it could be. Like you say, for a pound, you could buy that, copy and paste the code in, and, and you could be away by the sounds of it. Um, yeah. and, I know you said at the end to monitor. Do you think there is value in, in buying those, you know, sort of taking that preemptive action? You know, if there are some that are very similar, if, you know, if they are relatively cheap, is, is there value in, in sort of being proactive I, 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 and yeah, I, I, I think there is, Mark, um, very much so. I, um, I, I did look at uh, Mills and Reeve, actually, and I thought, well, perhaps you might be a, a good example, but I, I stuck with, with Blesma. Um, and, and Mills and Reeve has bought up a, an awful lot. Um, as you saw on the screen there, the, the majority are really low cost. Um, and if it just affords that, that extra layer of protection, then, then why not? Um, some smaller charities, particularly if we're looking at the, the, the .com, the, the .org addresses, um, and your charity domain name is, is fairly short, so it, it's something like Blesma, um, then that does see the, the, the price increase. But um, yeah, it's a, a small investment. Most of these web domains are, can be bought for a three year period. Um, and just keep it under review. Right, great, thank you. Okay. Um, I think there is one question. Uh, Carolyn's just asking if we could please share the nsc.org.uk website again, please. She just missed that. Was that on one of your slides? Uh, yeah, that was probably on the two, two back, Kate, I would think. I, 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 I presume we'll be in, in NCSC. CSC. Yeah. Yep. I think I think we'll be sharing I presume we'll be sharing our slides after the event um as well anyway. So um so that that that'll be coming to you as well if you're happy with that, Andrew. I'm yeah. Saying, yep. yeah, very much so. Um yeah, I have got a question for you, Mark, if you if you don't mind. Um, yeah, don't, oh no, we've we've got another one that's that's coming in. Well that's a, a thank you. Um, thanks, Carolyn. No, thanks, Carolyn, yes. Um just going back to uh, what you were talking about at the beginning, Mark, um, with um, sort of charity business being conducted remotely, where, where perhaps the constitution requires that to be done in person. 
um, and this might be a question for one of your employment law colleagues, but um, where, where charity staff are working from home rather than um, sort of being in an office where perhaps um, existing monitoring procedures um, would be in place and, and well documented, that does working from home change anything there and does that um, would that require charities to to put in place extra measures um or, or to make clear to staff that what, what they do online um can equally be monitored as if they were sitting in the office it's a good question i, I mean i think i think it is it is predominantly uh, i presume you're talking andrew about employees as opposed to sort of the trustee level I think yes. you're right, there's obviously a, a big employment law aspect to that. Um, and I do wonder whether, I'd be surprised if our employment team haven't already sort of commented on some of that. I'll, I'll double check that actually, and if we, when we're just following up on this to, to, to the delegates and with, with the slides, I will see if we've got something more specific on that. But I think just in, in, in general terms, I mean, that, that, those are the key questions, aren't they, around yeah. uh, how are we managing this? And I was on a trustee meeting just last night um obviously taking stock of the most recent announcement and as you said you, you yourselves and, and certainly we at m and r were looking to get back into the office a day or two a week until um obviously things have changed again so uh, i mean it completely depends doesn't it on the charity itself what can be done from home and what can't be done from home uh, mm -hmm. we, we were talking last night about the level of finance cover we need in the office as well as you know, some people being able to work from home. It's in, it, presumably it's entirely also what, what you're capable with your current current digital you know uh, facilities and, and whether you've got that ability and, and certainly some of the things I was trying to touch on was you know, get charities thinking about you know do they have the systems in place to protect against those sorts of risks. Um, I, I think you know, particularly if people are using their own devices to to dial into the organisation's network. Um, and, and then they're storing things on, on those devices that um, relate to the charity's business. Um, and I'm thinking from a, a fraud investigator's point of view, you know, how, how can I then get my hands on, um, uh, on mm. any evidence that, uh, that may be sitting there on those devices? Mm. Um, so much easier if it's um, the devices that belong to the charity. Yeah, absolutely. And I think that's one of the benefits potentially of cloud computing is that it can maybe stop that to some extent and have that security between, uh, you know, a, a computer owned um, and, and accessing a, a system sort of through, through a cloud service. Um, I'm lucky, you know, I've got a work, I've got a work laptop. Um, I'm, I'm lucky, but, but then I guess maybe that's part of the security thought behind it at M&R that, that actually I won't be accessing from a personal computer. It will always be a, a protected mm. computer. Um, so yeah, good, yeah, good question. I, I don't know the answer to that, but certainly um, uh, what, what I will, you know, just going back to the employment law points and, and, and you know, just general management of staff, um, I'm sure there's stuff out there and we'll, you know, I'll see what we've got to circulate to, to the delegates. Okay, thank you. Okay, I think we've, we've just gone over time now. I think if we bring that to an end, Vicky, have you, I don't know if you want, do you want to, uh, have you got anything to add, Vicky, or shall we just say um, thank you very much to everybody and um, I've not got anything um, particular, I'd just to say thank you um, to everybody for attending, hope you found it useful um, and uh, look forward to hopefully, um, well I don't really see you, but uh, seeing the list <laughs> of some of you um, again in December. Absolutely, okay. okay. Thank you very much. Great, thank you. Thank you. Bye.